Wow, that worked. Um, so I hope you're all in the right place. This is the Colonel uh, Minicon for LCA 2015. Uh, if you're in the wrong room, please leave quietly. Uh, today we've kind of got a half program, half unconference style mini conference. Um, some may say that's due to lack of organization and I'd have to own up to that. Um, so we're going to have a couple of presenters uh, up until just before lunch, uh, just after lunchtime and then unconference. So I'll uh, introduce Jeremy Kerr, he works at IBM Oslabs. Um, he's going to talk to you all about patchwork and how that's used for kernel development. Thank you, Tony. Um, as Tony said, I'm going to kick off the kernel mini-conf with uh, something that's not the kernel, and it's not even C. Um, so my name is Jeremy Kerr. I, uh, as Tony said, I work for the IBM Linux Technology Center. Um, and this is something that we've developed, uh, oh, sorry, I've developed uh, kind of in my spare time to help us do, do a bit of uh, open source work. Um, so some of you may be familiar with Patchwork, uh, and the reason I'm talking today is because it's getting a bit more usage uh, on, on kernel-based projects. So a lot of the sub-maintainers um, of various subsystems in Linux uh, have started using Patchwork, and this talk is intended to, to give you a bit of a guide to, to some of the, the lesser-known features of Patchwork and, um, and how you can use that to, to incorporate into your, into your workflow. When, when using the kernel and other projects as well, but focusing on the kernel today. So you may have seen Patrick before from um, patchwork.ozobzorg. We host uh, quite a few projects now, and patchwork.kernel.org um, hosts another set, but that's not maintained by, um, by us Ozlovers. Uh, and there's a few others uh, set around um, for, I think, uh, I think the OpenWRT guys, uh, some of the smaller projects have set up their own instance of Patchwork. It's, it's open source software, so they've, they've started their own servers and, and are running Patchwork on that. Um, but the talk today is based on sort of what we, the code levels we're running on, on Patchwork that Oslabs at all, because that, that's, what, that's what I control, so that, that's all I can talk about. So if you haven't seen Patchwork before, a um, bit, bit of a brief introduction. Um, so Patchwork is subscribed to various open source mailing lists uh, with the approval of the project, uh, project maintainer. It then receives all the mail from that list. And anything that finds as a patch in the, in the mail stream, it, uh, it parses and keeps a record of, of that patch in a, in a web UI. Uh, then we keep a little bit of inf other information about a patch uh, set by the maintainer of the project uh, itself. Uh, and they will basically record the state of the patch at the time. So it comes in, it'll be in new state, uh, it will then either be set by the maintainer to uh, accepted or rejected or under review or superseded or changes requested. So basically it's a state management system for, for patches. As, as a bug management system will keep track of the state of bugs, uh, patchwork will keep the state of, of incoming patches on a main list. And then that way we, we sort of track the flow of a patch um, in, in its lifetime either in incorporation into, the, into a project or rejection or a, a request for change. So this is what it looks like. Uh, this is um, the patchwork instance for one of our projects. Uh, and here we have a list of patches on the page and their states down the right hand side. So this tells us we have a few new patches that have come in and the rest mostly have been accepted by the, the project maintainer. So the idea here is we have a basic patch flow of um, new patch coming in, it goes into, into an under review state, uh, and then it's either accepted or rejected. There are other states as well, but this is kind of the main thing we're talking about. And the maintainer's job here, we want them rather than, rather than worrying about which patches uh, they haven't looked at or have looked at, they can concentrate on the actual patch review part of, the, of their work and not too much on maintaining mailing lists and, and maintaining you know, files of, of patches that need to be reviewed or that sort of thing. So Patchwork gives us a list of what needs to be done and forms a to-do list for, for our project maintainers. But also we want it to be useful for the project contributors as well. So the idea is there that the state, um, the state itself is visible to everyone in the community. They can see if their patch has been accepted or rejected or has, has had some sort of uh, action from the maintainer. If not, they can follow up or, or potentially see what, what's happening. Now today, um, I'm sure most of you have seen Patchwork in some form, you know, found a, a link from Google to a, the Patchwork page for Patch. Um, what I want to do is cover some of the, the lesser known sort of things about Patchwork. Um, one thing that's not that obvious from the web UI is we have a command line, a command line client for Patchwork called PWClient. Now if you go to the Patchwork website, there'll be a link to, to download 
the PW client script. It's just a, a very fit of Python, fairly self-contained, and allows you to interact with the patch database from the command line. So we have a sort of a Git style um, sub-command type thing. So PW client list uh, will give us a list of uh, some of the patches in our in our current project. So this, in this case, we're seeing uh, four patches, uh, one rejected, one new, two accepted. So that gives us a way of seeing what, uh, what patches are, are outstanding for a particular project by looking at just the, the new and accepted ones, for example. Oh, sorry, the new ones. Uh, and then we can use that to possibly feed into scripts for reviewing or, or whatnot on our, on our local machine. Uh, in terms of reviewing, we can download patches. Uh, you give it an, an ID. So all the, all the patch IDs, so all the patches are referenced by ID and patchwork. Um, and that will allow you just to download a particular patch. Often, you want to actually incorporate that into your version control system. So recently, we've added a PW client git am. That will download the patch and git am it to your tree uh, straight up. And then you can review it uh, as part of the um, as part of your normal Git workflow, as if you're merging from a, from a Git tree. Uh, and, and if it's acceptable, you don't have to do anything. We can also update the patch database from the command line. Um, so in this case, we're setting that status, the status of patch 44603 uh, to accepted. So that will then make the, the, the patch listed in the web UI as accepted. and. Uh, uh, Sort of inform the community that that um, that this patch has been has been accepted and is listed as such in the database. Now the the IDs are sort of they're, they're a unique way of of specifying a patch, but often we don't have a particular um, ID. We don't know the ID for a patch in advance, so we have this concept of um, of a hash for a patch, um, and this is a a hash of basically a subset of the lines in a patch. So we try and get the, the, the context. Uh, we also ignore things like uh, new lines and, and just and the, uh, I think the line offsets in the, in the patch itself. So that if a patch has been applied with a, a small amount of fuzz, we'll still match the same hash. And that, that allows us to reference patches in patchwork by the patch itself. So if you have a, a, a patch file uh, locally, you can generate a hash from it by feeding it on standard into this PW parser program, and that'll generate the hash. Then in PW client, rather than using referencing the patch by ID, you can reference it by hash with the minus h hash. So that's useful for. Um, in my case, I use it in a, a catch-up script. Um, so this script here will, between two revisions in Git, it will hash the patch that's in that forms that commit, uh, and then use that pat, the hash to reference the patch in PW client and update the state in patchwork to acceptance. Yes, Paul. No question. What if there's more than one patch in patchwork with the same hash? So Paul's question is, what if there's more than one patch in patchwork with the same hash? We will abort in that case. In, in fact, I think. Yeah, I, we, we don't, I'd sort of be conservative there and don't update the patch so that we, uh, we don't update the wrong thing. Question up the back here. Is there a way to update uh, patchwork just on the mailing list? Does it read the mailing list to see if you've accepted the patch? So the question was, can patchwork do this using, the, using mails on the mailing list? No, it can't. Uh, I'll cover some bits uh, that we can use the mailing list for control, but this isn't one of them. Um, the problem is that we don't, we don't really have any authentication. So anyone could send a message to the list that would update patchwork, um, you know, faking a, a maintainer's reply. I mean, it, it's, not, it's not such a serious concern. It's all, it's all open anyway. But my thinking there is we wouldn't do that. And, and if there is a good way we can incorporate that, I'd be happy to implement it. It's just the, the, the authentication there, which is my, my concern. So yeah, so this script here basically will generate the hashes and, and use those hashes to, to call PW client. And this will basically, since you've committed all these, these patches into your Git tree, they're, they're pretty much accepted, right? So it'll set all those, those states correspondingly in the patchwork database to accepted. Then you will basically remove them from the maintainer's to-do list, and you know that you don't have to, uh, have to action those anymore. One other recent uh, development is uh, patchwork notifications 
by email. So this is a, an example that was sent to me, I think, in March. Um, it, and it's told me that uh, three of my patches for the FWTS project have been changed state from new into accepted. So this isn't used by many projects at the moment. It's, it's enabled or disabled on a per project basis. Um, and the reason we don't have it enabled a lot is uh, that generally a maintainer will do this anyway. So they'll often say accepted thanks um, rather than relying on patchwork to do that. But if you are running a patchwork uh, a project that's managed through patchwork, um, just let me know and I can enable this for, for your for usage and you don't have to send those accepted thanks uh, mails out. Otherwise, um, this is what they do. And the idea here is that we, we batch the updates to about 10 minutes. So if you're updating patchwork and doing changes, if there are no new notifications to go to one user for 10 minutes, then the email goes out. So the idea is you don't get spam people with every single change that happens. We group it all together. Um, some of the other, as we sort of touched on earlier, um, mail control facilities Patchwork has is the ability to set um, various properties of a patch or control how Patchwork parses one incoming patch. So as, as the original patch is coming, we can set various headers. Now the first one is uh, tell Patchwork to completely ignore this patch. Um, now when I was maintaining one of the, the subsystems in the kernel, I would often send out a summary of this is my, my changes going into the next merge window. And because they've, all those patches have already come through the mailing list, there's no reason for, for Patchwork to track those again, because they'd just be duplicates. So I just set this header on the mails going out to say, don't track it. Uh, it's also good for if you're including like an example patch in a, in, a, in a conversation. So you're saying, let's do it like this instead. You don't want it actually to be merged as a patch itself. You can just say, add this header to your mail, and Patchwork will just ignore it happily. Another one is you can actually set patchwork states, the initial state of a patch. So again, they, these headers are all for the initial patch that goes out. You can set the initial state for a patch to um, certain values. So in this case, we're setting it as an RFC, meaning that the maintainer doesn't necessarily have to action, you know, apply or reject or anything like that, um, and, and can use that original state in the, the patch database and, and mark it as such. One interesting thing is you can do this, uh, but uh, you pretty probably don't want to do that. Um, patchwork also has the concept of delegates. So when a larger project such as the kernel, um, uh, even kernel subsystems have delegates responsible for certain bits. For example, in PowerBC, we have um, a, a, a PowerBC maintainer plus subsystem maintainers that do various um, features or board support or platform support. And so we have delegates for patches. So a patch that comes in that touches the 32-bit PowerPC code may go to one maintainer. A patch that comes in that touches the KVM code may go to someone else. We, we actually reviewed by that person. So we have this concept of delegates. And you can set a delegate on an incoming patch by email on your header. If you already know who is going to be reviewing your patch, you can set this header and it will uh, automatically be delegated, delegated first thing when the patch comes in. And it means that the maintainer doesn't have to go through that list and find out, okay, this is a 32-bit PowerPC patch, I need to assign it. It's already assigned before, before the start. Um, now, I'd probably suggest working with the, your, your subsystem in, in working out who is responsible for what. If you've been working in an area for a while, you probably know who's going to be reviewing your patches, and this can, this can be a helpful little, sort of skipping that first stage of patch review, um, of not patch review, but the, the first stage of, of triage and getting it to the right person to review. Another feature we've added fairly recently is we count now the act review and tested by tags on a patch. Um, it's, it's still under development. I'll cover sort of some of the, the more controversial bits of this in a second. But um, so if a patch comes in, if there's any acts reviewed or tested by tags in the original patch, we count them. If there's any follow-up mails coming in that have one of those tags, uh, it'll also be counted. And then we display that on the, on the web UI. So this is an example list of, of some patches that hit the, the PowerPC list recently. Um, and we have this ART column, A slash R slash T, act review tested, uh, and the counts of those tags that have hit each patch. Now the idea here is, is some, some projects use uh, criteria before a patch will be reviewed or be accept, uh, considered as, as upstreamable. Uh, and often people go, oh, we need two acts before we 
before you review it by the maintainer, to sort of spread the load a bit. So the idea here is that if you have something like that, that policy on your, on your subsystem or your project, you can wait till that A, a column is hit two and then review it, or what, implement whatever policy you need, but it gives a summary of, of, um, of what has happened so far without actually digging into the patch itself and, and looking at, um, looking through all the comments and finding those things. So as I said, it's a bit of an a underdevelopment feature at the moment. Um, we, we've settled on these three tags uh, by default. Um, I haven't been asked for any other tags, but I don't want to sort of paint myself into a corner and, and only ever support those three. So there is, a, um, I guess, a question whether we support custom tags uh, on that, um, you know, if we have some other, some, uh, someone influenced like a CI process that adds a tag. Do we, do we add that or do we, do we not? And which projects will use which tags? So there's a bit of, I guess, discussion going on about that. And also how you sort. How do you, can you sort by the ART column? Does that allow you to, does it sum it? So there's still some, some design features there. If you have any brilliant ideas, please let me know. One of the other features, or one of the other sets of changes that's been happening last year is a lot of documentation uh, particularly about the installation process. So we've tried to slicken up the, the installation project process for Patchwork itself. That's if you're looking to run a Patchwork system on your server. Um, I'm, I'm guessing most people don't, but if that's the case, then, then have a look. A lot of the, the documentation around the PW client binary has been fixed as well. So we, we've added some of the help there, made it a bit more, um, bit more intuitive, perhaps. Um, one of the things that, that happens during a patchwork talk is, is feature requests. So we're always, um, always happy to, to find out how people are using patchwork, um, what, what things are missing. I mean, the idea about it is, is to enable communities to, to work better. So if there are feature requests, either we'll chat about it in the, the Q&A session or, uh, or just come and find me after, after the talk. Um, also, if you're interested in, in developing Patchwork, I've got a few slides on, on how that all works. Um, as I said, it's all, all open source. Uh, it's all in Git. Um, it's a, so it, it, again, it's, um, it's written in Python. It's using a, a, a web framework called Django. Um, if you're familiar with that, you probably know more than I do about Patchwork. Um, and, and it's very easy to, to, well, it's relatively easy to set up a, a development system without having to install a, you know, a, a full web server and configure Apache. Um, the way you do that is you just create the so once you've downloaded the git tree, um, there's a, uh, a manage.py script. So you use your, in this case, Postgres create db command to actually create an empty database. Uh, the sync db, sync db command will initialize all the tables that Patchwork needs. And then the third line run server will actually run a, a little web server completely in Python that you can use to make changes to the source and, and run it without having to, like I said, install Apache, install um, and configure Apache, do all the other sorts of things. Um, the actual, the web framework we're using is, is Django, as I said, and there are some great docs on the docs.djangoproject.com website. Um, and that basically, Patchwork is a very, well, quite a thin layer above, above the, the facilities that Django provides. So that will kind of give you all the bits you need to start, start hacking on, on uh, on Patchwork. Uh, if you're looking at hacking on the, the PWB client binary, that's, uh, that's pure Python. It just uses XML RPC to talk to, um, talk to the Patchwork server, so you don't need to do any Django stuff for that. You can just start, start messing with Python there. One other important thing on the, the, the server side is we have a, a fairly comprehensive um, test suite. Uh, so this, this command will test any changes you've made to Patchwork. Uh, and if you're fixing bugs or, or implementing new features, um, having a, a test suite will, will always help. Um, also on the development side, we've had quite a few, um, uh, quite a bit of activity recently on the list um, where uh, some, some folks, I think, from Intel have implemented a new UI for Patchwork. So my plan for the next, um, I guess in the next month, is to set up a beta.patchwork.oslabs.org site where we can try new, um, new UI features, things that don't affect the database. Uh, and run that against the existing Patchwork database, so we have sort of two things running at once, and we can do a bit of um, bit of comparison and a bit of experimentation on, on on what's going there. So I guess that that an encouragement to if you have a UI change you want to try out, um, send me a patch, and we can we can try it on the on the beta website, um, and then no one's going to yell at you 
uh, straight away at least. So kind of uh, a couple of important uh, resources here. Uh, the website for Patchwork and the Patchwork mailing list. Of course, it's tracked with Patchwork. Um, that doesn't mean I'm great at uh, following the Patchwork lists, but uh, yeah, we, we have a list and a, um, a website. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Uh, I, I usually end my slides with a, a thank you um, thank you note, but I, I wanted to back it up with some data, so I, I ran this. Um, so basically finding all of the comments, the initial comments on all the patches, so basically the, the, the line, the, the metadata you submit with the patch. Found all the ones that were accepted and which ones had thank in the comment, and we got this. Which means, accepted. so if you say thanks in your original patch, you get a 39.5% hit rate. If you don't say thanks in your cat patch, you get about a 43% hit rate, or percent accepted rate. So, uh... <laughs> um, now, I, I guess I was planning for a lot of discussion. Um, feature requests, that sort of thing. Is anyone opening things up, or...? Excellent, Paul. What was This, this, uh, so Paul's asking, what's the statistical significance of the, uh... I apologize for the question. Yeah, I, yeah. Um, so probably, probably not very high. Uh, I can give you the data if you want. I, I this was a late night, uh... Yeah, this is quite a few Um, we have about, so this, this, in this case, we were using just the, the kernel-based list that, that we track on Oslab, so Linux, PPC, and NetDev. Um, it may be different from other projects. Maybe, maybe they're more polite elsewhere, but uh, that's what we get. So the, the question was, we've, we've done some integration work with, um, actually I'll put the, put the polite version back up. Um, we've done some integration work with Git. Is there any plans to do integration work with other um, version control systems? Um, the integration work we've done with Git is very minimal. Um, the only, just, just as a quick thing, the only thing that we actually do is the PW client Git AM. Uh, and there's no reason we couldn't implement the same functionality with a different um, different ver version control system. And there's nothing, there's no kind of, I, I've intentionally made it VCS independent. So there's nothing that assumes Git. Uh, there might be kind of some sugar we can add to, to make it work better with other VCSs. And basically the only reason I've used Git is that's because that's I use. So that's all. If, if there's other things, then I'd be happy to, happy to look at that. Yes, do you wait for the mic because that's coming down and working. Do we have the mic? Um, what, what are your plans in terms of scope? Like how far do you want to implement features that say are available like on sites like Bitbucket, GitHub, which have quite a variety of things around um, the source control. So like perhaps integrate, like having an API so that um, projects that have say continuous integration can apply patches and kick off builds based on that kind of thing. Yeah, I think um, I, I want the, the, the core of Patchwork to be simple. Uh, I don't want it to grow into, into doing our CI stuff on the Patchwork side. Um, so I'd rather go in the approach where, like I said, if we could provide an API, then, um, then we can do that. Um, like I said, the, the PW client interface uses a, an XML RPC API, so it can be used by anything else. Um, it may not be suitable for other ones because we haven't kind of considered that in the design. Um, one of the one of the things I would like to do is to rework that API, and if there's a basically a second consumer of that, then that will give us some, some more data points about what the new new version should look like. And and you know, again, the simplified simplified way to go is I think um, would be preferable for me. So there there's some sort of craft we've we've built up over hooking the API directly into the PW client or making the API very much customised to the PW client um, consumer. But if there are other things as well, then then we can definitely help us to define what, what the new API looks like. Cheers. There's another question over here earlier. Sir? Nope, I think we're good. Uh, Tony. Wait. 
So um, I understand the issues around authentication and stuff like that, but you know when you release a version two of a patch series, right? Yep. Is there any way to automatically supersede the version one or the previous versions of that patch series? That's what I'd love to do. Um, so having having that that automatic superseding kind of actually saves a lot of work for the maintainer. So it, it's something that would give us a lot of work. The only problem is I, I haven't figured out a reliable way to do that yet. Um, now, I could argue that something semi-reliable would be better than nothing. Uh, I'm not sure yet, but... Um, because there's multiple different ways that someone follows up to a patch. Someone can reply with a, a something that goes on top of that patch, or something that goes alongside that patch, or something that completely replaces that patch, or just a little fragment of patch that um, that says no, you should do, it, do this particular part this way. So um, doing it automatically, I guess, is hard. If we can assist patchwork with some some headers or some some bits of things there, that'd be cool. Um, but I'm not sure. So, so maybe there's there's something we can do with with looking at the actual contents of the diff itself. You know, if the diff, diff's that similar, maybe it's a it's an update. Um, but uh, I don't I don't want to sort of do it and get it only half yeah. right. So, Jeremy, um, what would be really uh, good for that is to have Git send an email at those X patchwork headers. Yes, yeah. Um, and then you can have superseded in there or RFC and things like that because, I mean, that's how we tell the email subject line what the patch is going to be, whether there's a V2 in it or there's yep. an RFC and so yep. on. So actually making that sort of status a, a first-class citizen of Git send email in yep. some way, um, that can then, because there's other tools that are built on top of Git send email that could use that, like yep. uh, Gilt and, and whatnot. Um, so actually having that metadata come through the actual uh, formatting process as the the diffs or the patches are pulled out of, of Git would just flow through. Yep. Then you've got uh, an official protocol way of doing it. Mm. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah. the what I would say is you can add a, a header that says this patch supersedes this other patch. But having that, I'm not sure how we can, you know, when you do the original rebase to make V2 of the series, do we keep any information about the ones that it's reversed? Right, yeah. So yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah. So the the um, the the states definitely will will help there, but we can't. Once a patchwork has hit, sorry, once a patch has hit patchwork, we can't update the state any longer from email. So we will need to have some sort of way of saying that this one. You can set the state of the patch that's that's actually coming in, but not some other patch that's already in the database. So we need to we need to add that functionality to say this patch is new and it also supersedes this other one over here. Um, yeah, yeah, something like that would be great. And then having that, you need to know the, the the referencing before the email was generated, which is which is the not not it's just an engineering problem. Right? We can. Uh, yep. Yep. Definitely, definitely. So the, the comment there is that having having the tools understand that will give us the method of of the assistance that Patrick needs to do that. The, um, the Garrett um, change ID stuff's quite a pain to set up and you know and be enforced on. I've tried using Garrett for a bit, but it is at least you know one one way of ensuring that you get you know that consistent flow through of what what a patch was as it as it moves moves along through yep. development. As long as something's adding it in, I mean I'd prefer that patchwork just nicely added it in if you didn't have it because the Garrett way of you're rejected if you haven't got it there is a pain. Right. But at least. You know, it could mangle the patch to put the line in, and when you download it from Patchwork, at least you would have that line, and someone and it would notice the next one. It doesn't help with the, you know, someone just grabbing it straight off the mailing list, though. Yes. Um, people would have to, you'd probably would have to encourage folks to add one themselves before they sent it. Yes, um, yes. But it, it's the best, it, it feels miserable, but it's one of the better ones I've seen. All right. And a lightweight version of that might be your best option. Definitely, definitely. And it's a couple of, I guess, design It'd be points. It would also be really good if it was compa use the same, same compatible things so that we could try yeah. and try yeah. out different systems. Definitely. A um, couple of design points of patchwork are, firstly, that I don't want to enforce the use of patchwork for a project. So um, if someone's happy using the mailing list, um, they shouldn't have to be interacting with patchwork on a 
on a daily basis if, if they don't want to. So it should be the maintainer's choice to use that to manage their workflow, but the contributors, we don't want to add an extra step to contribution. We don't want to make it, you know, you have to learn this thing to contribute to our other projects. So um, we, have the, we have the optionality of, of using patchwork. And the second one is I don't want to start adding um, unnecessary, well, adding patchwork specific metadata to a project's change history. Um, you, know, you want your change history to be pristine only about the, the project itself rather than adding bits that are tool specific or something else. So I need to figure out a way of, of having some sort of tracking across different sets of patches to say this one's related to that one without affecting the version control, which may be, may be more challenging than, than, than I'd like. But uh, yeah, if, 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 if there is some way, that'd be ideal. Uh, Paul, that uh, was one of the back. Do you think there's any advantage to scanning mailing list archives for historical data? Um, not really. Uh, I think for, for the projects that have um, started using Patchwork, no one's requested to um, to pre-populate it with, with stuff. Basically because it gives you a huge workload to start with. You've got all these patches in a new state and, you know, we saw about 50% of them would be accepted. So there's a whole lot of, of kind of workload that creates just by, by doing that initial import. Um, but it, it definitely can be done. I've, I've, when, I, um, when I set up a test instance of Patchwork, I often load up the, the PowerPC we see mailing list into it just as a, a test data set. So we, we can just run the parser on an existing inbox and, and it works fine. Paul, yeah, got the... As you're throwing. Um, just sort of following on with that thing of uh, authenticating users, I'm just wondering what other authentication and authorization things you think are going to be needed in the future for if you're talking about a large project which might be distributed and might be dealing with people of you know less than pure intent. So, are you asking how we would implement a, a secure patch update system? Or? Oh, do, uh, well, I'm thinking more what types of authentication and authorization do you think are, are useful in that context? Well, the, the thing more than just a sort of email address kind of thing. I mean, the email's fine. It's a way of transporting a bunch of text. Um, we need to make sure that whoever's updating a patch is a maintainer of the project. So that means that you can't do things like if a, let's say a security up change is coming in, if I can personate the maintainer, I can say, look, it's rejected or it's accepted, and then it never shows up in the, the, main, the actual maintainer's workflow. So that's kind of the situation I want to avoid there. Um, and we can do that just by, let's say, we could GPG assign the mail that, that updates patchwork. Um, and, and perhaps uh, have some method of... Um, setting up the you know, acceptable keys that are available um, for a specific project. So if you get a sign mail that is a, an update command, then we need to authenticate it against the correct users. So that, that will probably be the simplest, simplest thing to do. Um, uh, it's just a more engineering problem. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think it's, it's incredibly hard. It's just someone needs to do it. Um, and, and I guess the, the fallback there is that you can just use PW client to do that anyway. So if you're running a script to sign a mail and do things, you could just run PW client and update patchwork that way rather than sending an email. So, um, it, it, I mean, it, it does solve the problem of sending one email to both inform the list that the patch has been accepted and to set it to update the state in patchwork. So that's nice. Uh, and if we can do that, that'd be great. That's Paul. Does patchwork have the notion of a set of patches, like a series of patches, one of five, two of five, up to five of five, and does it treat them as a unit in any sense? No, it doesn't. So that, that has does to be done manually. to do that? Someone has to do that, yep. Uh, and the idea that it's, is you can, you may want to just accept one of three rather than all of three. Um, and, and we'd have to sort of keep the, the, same, uh, the same granularity as we have now, but allow you to do yeah, to do actions in one. Now we ha sort of have a, a manual way of doing that, as in you can create a bundle of those one of n or the n of n patches, and then up basically update the state of every patch in the bundle. But again, that bundle has to be created manually. So if I can do that, um, there's been there's been some suggestion that we we should just look at the m slash n in a patch subject and try and correlate it with other patches. 
um, and that would be ideal. But uh, again, it's just it's no one's actually implemented it yet. But I'd like to do that. Yes. Yeah, I was thinking it would actually make the process of uh, superseding patches a lot easier if you could match up the subject on the zero of n. Yes. With the subject on you know probably the same subject on the zero of n the next time. Yep. Even if all the all the patches in the in the series have got different names. Well, we got a X series supersedes sort of thing. So again, we could use the um, yeah, definitely sounds good. Yeah. Patches up. I don't speak Python. <laughs> Great. Any other questions? Any feature requests? <laughs> Excellent. I'm out of here. Thank you very much.